And Lord, we pray that you would now well, answer that prayer, that Lord, you would fall on this place and put a fire in our hearts, a passion for you. And we ask you to bless now this time in your word. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Uh, can I have you turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 18? We are about to come out of a very dark period, which we have been studying, and which is coming upon the world, but we won't see it, I'm convinced, and yet we are studying about it. But after this chapter, it's like the sun breaks through on a very, very cloudy, stormy day. And when I say the sun breaks through, I'm talking about the Son of God. He will return in chapter 19. Uh, so, but let me just say this. In our study in Revelation, we are currently, uh, as you know, in chapter 18, where God is judging and destroying commercial Babylon which will be the commercial capital of the world during the reign of the Antichrist. And as we've already talked about, many people believe that the Babylon of chapter 18 will literally be the ancient city of Babylon rebuilt on the Euphrates River in modern Iraq. Others believe it will be some other major city of the world, New York, London, Paris, some other main or major city that is being metaphorically referred to as Babylon. Let me just say this again. Whatever the city and wherever it is located, it will be the capital of the political power and commercial wealth of the beast, the Antichrist, and his kingdom during the tribulation period. So tonight, let's pick it up in verse 8. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Now, commentators uh, prior to the nuclear age said that a city can't be destroyed, a city can't fall in one hour, so therefore the language must be allegorical, okay? Uh, we know better. We know better. I believe nuclear destruction is in view uh, here, uh, seeing as how the whole city is utterly destroyed in a single hour, and how the kings of the earth, this is the thing that really nails it for me, how the kings of the earth are standing at a good distance away for fear of her torment, which I believe is the radiation that is being emitted by the city now after she has been nuked or something to that effect. All right, Verse 11, And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. The word translated weep in verses 9 and 11 is a Greek word that means a loud lamentation, to wail and howl. Here's the thing. Notice that the merchants are not weeping for their sins. I mean, God has just judged their capital, right? You'd think they would fall to their knees and say, we better get right with this God. No, they're not weeping for their sins. They're not weeping for the sins of the city. They're weeping for themselves. Why? What's going on? Well, uh, they're, they're wailing loudly because they have lost valuable customers. I, isn't that amazing? If you've ever studied the Titanic and how it sank, initially they didn't think it was, going, it was capable of sinking. And then when it hit the iceberg, they still were convinced it was unsinkable. So what happened was the band moved up to the main deck and they began to play. People were dancing. And they didn't realize until the ship began to list way to one side that they were in mortal trouble. And by the time it dawned on them that they had better start moving towards the lifeboats, many of the lifeboats had gone out half full because nobody was using them. 
And so many people died that didn't have to die because they, could, they weren't reading properly the signs of the situation. Uh, I don't see how these people are going to be ignorant. You've got God preaching to them for the last six and a half years practically, uh, the gospel from every direction. Uh, and yet, I, it's not that they don't know the gospel. They refuse to believe it. They are so hard-hearted. Um, you know, it's what Paul called, in a different context, but the same idea. Remember, he talked about worldly sorrow, right? Well, let me read you what he says in 2 Corinthians 7. He had to fire a letter off to the Corinthians. It was pretty heavy because they were really carnal and they were just not really living properly. So he fires them off a pretty harshly worded letter. And, uh, and they read it and they, re they sorrowed. And it led to repentance. And he commends them. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry by my letter, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner. For a godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Slightly different context here, but the idea of the world sorrowing. We think, wow, they're crying. It's a good sign, right? Not necessarily. Why are they crying? And here we see they're not crying because they've violated God's laws. They're not crying because they've grieved the heart of God. They're not even crying because judgment is coming and they need to get right. They're crying because their businesses are no longer prospering. That blows my mind. I mean, they're on the verge of total judgment and destruction and they're worried about their businesses. I mean, God has brought an end, or from our context, He will bring an end to their life of luxury and wealth but their tears aren't tears of repentance. Uh, and then, so that we don't try to spiritualize this passage, the Holy Spirit writing through John lists 28 items of merchandise that comprised the merchant's cargo or freight. This is what they, their wares, what they dealt in, what they sold. Verse 12 they sold merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble, the cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The Holy Spirit took the time to list all of these commodities to show us they are little, literal commerce. Don't spiritualize them. When the Holy Spirit makes it a point to do something like this, to really itemize like he did in chapter 7 with 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, and he kept repeating 12,000 from this tribe, 12, until he got to the 144,000. He did that so people wouldn't spiritualize the text. Do people spiritualize Revelation 7? Sure. J.W. said, we're the 144,000. This group says, no, we're the 144,000. But here the Holy Spirit does it again because he wants us to understand that this is literal commerce, literal commerce, and therefore that the Babylon of Revelation 18 is a literal city whatever city it winds up being. Now, I want you to take note of something. All of these items are luxuries, not necessities. Don't miss that. It gives us a picture of how unbridled materialism will dominate and control the people of the world just prior to God destroying the capital city and the Antichrist global government. Now, understand, as we have said before, by the time you move into Revelation uh, and the Antichrist establishes his one world government, you're going to have two classes of people only, the rich and the poor. Middle class will be gone. The very wealthy are seeking to get rid of the middle class even as we speak and have been for a while. Okay, It's going to come to fruition. It's become a reality during the Antichrist reign. There's going to only be two classes, the rich and the poor. And you know, today the very rich want two classes, and they want themselves to be held up as like the rulers, the leaders, and the very poor to serve them. 
And that's how it's getting. The middle class has gotten a little too big for its britches, they say. You know? Uh, we're living pretty comfortable lives, or we were for a long time. Yeah, we go where we want. We eat all kinds of meat. We're meat eaters. We like to drive our F-150 pickup trucks. Not that I have one, but a lot of conservatives do. And they guzzle a lot of gas. Who do you uh, middle class people think you are? Going to knock you down a few pegs. They want to get rid of us. And, and during the Antichrist, there's going to be two classes of people. The rich who will rule and prosper and have all these luxuries. Yeah, of course, necessities. But they're going to have luxuries. And the poor, well... They're going to um, just survive. Just survive. Remember in Revelation 6, verse 6, when God is judging and God is bringing famine and he's bringing devastation. Revelation 6, verse 6 says, but in light of all of this devastation for everyone else, don't touch the oil and the wine. Though the rich, which we believe is a reference to the wealthy, they're going to always have what they need to live. It's everyone else is going to suffer. Remember, guys, that the destruction of commercial Babylon <clears throat> will take place at the end of the Great Tribulation period. I mean, right near now, the end of the seven years, right near the return, just prior to the return of Jesus to establish his kingdom. There are many people who believe, this is a little side thought, but I thought I should bring it up. There are many people who believe that in Matthew 24, which is also uh, gives us a list of what events are going to happen before Jesus returns. So they dovetail, okay? But um, why don't you turn to Matthew 24, because I want to show you something. There are many who believe that in Matthew 24, and I'm thinking primarily of verses 36 to 41, that the rapture is in view, not the second coming. Let me read verses 36 to 41, Matthew 24. Now, again, the context is the time just prior to Jesus' return. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What day? Uh, nobody. The, the exact moment Jesus returns. Now, the question is, is it talking about his return for the church? Or is it talking about his return at the second coming? All right, let's read the passage. But as the days of Noah were, keep that in mind, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming, listen now, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. And many good Bible scholars said, look, that can't be the second coming. Why? Because they're eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. I've heard phenomenal Bible scholars, people that I learned, have learned much from, say, well, you can't have this be the second coming because there's going to be no normalcy left just prior to Jesus' return, right? You've got cataclysmic judgments and this happening. and The world is just reeling. It's being torn apart. Eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Come on, how could that? This has got to be the rapture. And for many years, I really believed it was the rapture. And I'm not saying I'm right, but I've changed my view. I think it's the second coming. Why do I believe that? Because the disciples asked the Lord Jesus to start this whole discourse, the Olivet Discourse, right, uh, about his coming. You know, they said to him, you know, he said, look, I'm going away. End of Matthew 23. I'm going away. You're not going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He leaves the temple area, walks through the eastern or the golden gate, uh, over the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, and sits down, and his disciples follow him. And they said, Lord, you're going away, but what are going to be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? They're thinking kingdom. They're thinking the establishing of the kingdom. This is a very Jewish question. 
The church wasn't even going to be born for two months. These guys are not thinking like New Testament Christians. They're thinking like Old Testament Jews. And the Jewish people had always wanted to know, well, Messiah is coming. He's going to establish the kingdom. They believed Jesus was the Messiah, and now he's talking about going away. How could that be? You're supposed, you can't go away. You're supposed to establish the kingdom. So they come to him, and they ask him a very Jewish question. What will the signs be of your return and you're going to, then when you are going to establish the kingdom is what they were basically asking. So he launches into this discourse and, and you can study this on your own. I will just say this when he talks about, uh, you know, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the, the, the gain of the prophet standing in the holy place. Right. Uh, don't even go back into your houses to get any clothing. Run to the wilderness. Right. And pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath. Why, why should we care if our, if our flight, if you're talking about just the world in general, Christians, why should we care if the Antichrist does this on the Sabbath? Well, if you're in Israel, it's a big deal. You can't get a taxi. You can't get a bus. You can't get a plane. You're going to have to escape on foot or your car if you can get enough gas to go drive it. You know, um, you know and, and, and so he, t he gives this very Jewish answer. Um, and then he talks about, as is it, is it was in the days of Noah, so it's going to be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, that's important. I want you to think this through, right? Until the flood came and took them all away, all right? What happened when God brought the flood, all right? Who was left on the earth and who was swept away in judgment? Noah and his family entered the ark. The flood came. And all the unbelievers were washed away in judgment. And Noah and his family were left on the earth. They emerged the ark, uh, from the ark and they repopulated the earth, right? So th during Noah's day, the unbelievers were taken away. The righteous were st stayed on the earth. At the rapture, what happens? Who was taken and who was left? Well, at the rapture, the righteous are taken off the earth and the unbelievers are left to undergo God's judgment during the tribulation period. That's not like the days of Noah. What's going to happen at the second coming? Who's going to be taken? Who's going to be left? When Jesus comes back again, the Bible tells us he's going to send his angels out to the four corners of the earth, gather everybody who's alive back to Jerusalem. And there won't be as many as you think because most of the earth has been wiped out. And so they enter into this judgment. If they're righteous, if they've received Christ, they're going to be allowed to stay on the earth and enter, enter the millennial kingdom. If they're unbelievers, they will be removed from the earth and sent to Hades. So I, I really believe this is talking about the second coming. And you might think to yourself, but Phil, how could it, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, how is that possible? We have to understand, and, and Revelation 18 is telling us this. You're going to have, yes, a lot of devastation, a lot of suffering. But the wealthy are going to be doing pretty well. The wealthy, they're going to have plenty to eat. They're going to have a lot of go, And they are the ones that it's not going to affect them like you think. Now, yeah, there's been a lot of judgment. and The world is uh, messed up and wars and famine and pestilence. Yeah, I'm not saying that they're, they're going to escape all that. But they're going to have the best medical care, access to medicine. Everybody else will probably be without any medicine, me medical care. They're going to die. The poor are going to die in droves, okay? But the idea is that it, it's not as foreign as you might think, uh, this two-tier existence. I just finished reading The Hiding Place, you know, Corey Ten Boom's story. And one thing that struck me is while they, the Ten Boom family and so many others uh, in, in that part of the world were taken captive by the Nazis, placed in concentration camps, and Corey talks about the conditions, brutal conditions, um, the just the lack of, san uh, of sanitation and the food they were given to eat. They were literally starving, just enough food to keep them alive. And you look at their life, and then you, the book talks about, in passing, other people that were pretty well off, knew the right people, maybe slipped some of the people in charge money. They were left alone 
they had some restrictions, but for the most part, their lives were pretty normal. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. I think that that's what's going on here. Um, we think, how could there be any normalcy? Well, here in Revelation 18, just prior to the Lord's return, just prior to the complete destruction of the world government under Antichrist, they're doing pretty well for themselves, these merchants. I mean, they're selling all kinds of luxury items, and the wealthy have the money to buy them and benefit from them, right? Something to think about. You say, well, are the wealthy going to get away with it then? You know, are they going to just skate? No, no. Proverbs 11, verse 4, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. So, God is going to bring judgments that will wipe out a lot of these wealthy, and those that make it survive. They're going to stand before Christ uh, before he establishes his kingdom. They're going to be cast into Hades. And the righteous believers in Christ who have escaped the Antichrist have made it to the end of the seven years. And here Jesus has come back. Now they're going to enter into the millennial kingdom. But uh, I like what uh, James writes in James 5, verses 1 to 3. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat up your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Uh, I think that what James is talking about, he is talking about ultimately the judgment upon the wicked, you know. Um, some of that will happen during the tribulation period. Some of it was, is going to happen, though, for some. They're going to be alive when the Lord comes, and they're going to be judged, cast into, uh, into Hades. It's like the, the rich man and Lazarus, right? That's kind of the imagery. You have Lazarus, this poor, diseased beggar who was a believer, and Lazarus, who was an unbeliever, wealthy and lived sumptuously. And, you know, they both died, and Lazarus wound up in Abraham's bosom place of paradise and the rich man wound up in the torment side of hell where he is still being tormented as we speak so it's going to be in the days coming now last on the list and most disturbing by far is the statement that during this time one of the things the merchants of the earth will deal in will be the buying and selling of human beings revelation 18 verse 13 it says it this way they trafficked in or they dealt or they merchandised in the body and souls of men the sense chills up your spine the bodies and souls of men during this time one of the things that the merchants of the earth will deal in is slavery it's human traffic the buying and selling of slaves uh, it has been estimated that one-third of Rome's population was enslaved. A third of their population was slavery. Their economy was built on slave labor, okay? Um, and that it was not unusual, historians tell us, for, listen, 10,000 human beings on any given day to be auctioned off in each of the great slave markets of the empire. Historians have estimated that there were roughly 60 million, probably more than that, 60 million or more slaves throughout the Roman Empire in the first century, where John lived until he was taken into the future. But um, these people were treated like pieces of furniture. They were bought and sold. They were used and abused like mere things. They had no rights. I read a story about a... Uh, a wealthy uh, slave owner and he was talking to his friend about he could do anything to his slaves because they're his property and not get in any trouble I could kill one of them he said and the friend said oh you couldn't do that sure I could call one of the slaves over knifed him in the heart killed him see that's how they thought it was it was no big deal these people weren't even human that that's was the mentality now what I'm it the question is is John suggesting that during this period there's going to be a return to slavery? 
Well, not, not only do I think it's a possibility, I think it will be a definite probability. As I've said, I believe the Antichrist kingdom will be communistic at its core, especially towards the poor and political enemies. Slavery has always been a part of communism because communism devalues life. Communism, again, is not a system built on God. Why do you think as Americans or as in the West in general, there is a, a, a sanctity for life? the belief in the sanctity of life. Now, it's changing, obviously, has for uh, several decades. But it was the gospel of Jesus Christ, the belief in the God of the Bible, that caused people to realize, because God said it in his word, that life is precious. All life is precious, right? But communism has no God except a state. And therefore, the state tells you what your rights are. And to the state, you're nothing but a tool. Uh, Corey Timboom brings out that for a long time, um, nobody knew her name, just her number. They dehumanize you. You give you a number, and you're not, you know, Corey or Phil or Cindy or Kathy or whatever. You are numbered, you know, 975827. And that's what you're, ref and that's purposeful. They want to, uh, to dehumanize you because then it gives people more the idea that you're just a tool of the state. You're not a human being with God-given rights. This has always been a part of communism. It would take, I think, little imagination to conceive of a system of universal enslavement under the rule of the beast, the Antichrist. I don't think it's hard for us to comprehend that. We've already seen that he will require his mark on everyone who would buy or sell. Revelation 13 talked specifically about that. And that he will demand all people to worship him and his image, which his image will be placed in the re Holy of Holies in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Any who refuse to worship him and his image will be put to death. And I think it's reasonable. I think it's reasonable to imagine that those who don't take his mark or worship his image, will be placed, at least initially, into forced labor camps. Slavery. State-sanctioned slavery. Where the poor especially will be made to work to enrich the Antichrist government. And think about this, and you can check uh, Revelation 6, verse uh, 6 uh, later, where people will be made to uh, work in these forced labor camps for the state, maybe, and this is possibly one of the things Revelation 6, verse 6 alluded to, work all day for just enough bread to survive yourself. And that will be in this situation. Um, prisoners of the state, enemies of the state, but useful to the state to accomplish objectives build roads or whatever the state needs and they'll use them up and use them up until finally they're they're you know they've outlived their usefulness uh whether they die first or they've outlived their usefulness and they're executed by the state um you know this is how they're going to be treated and all the while the wealthy they're dancing and having a good time they're living high you know they're connected um they know the right people in power, no doubt, giving people money to leave them alone and let them live their lives, um, you know, in a way that no other kind of group can live, right? Uh, I mean, isn't this exactly what we see going on in communist China with the Muslim Uyghurs? These people that have been enslaved by the Chinese government who have to work in these, uh, these slave labor camps. Uh, women routinely raped and even gang raped. They're not people. They're just objects to be used to, uh, to um, enrich the state, uh, to satisfy the sexual desires of communist soldiers. It's amazing. Now, at very least, at very least, the Antichrist will enslave the people of the world through their own lusts. Yep, many will be literally enslaved. But for the rest of the people, 
I'm talking about the wealthy now who think they're so free, you know. At very least, the Antichrist will enslave the people of the world to their own lust by offering them the opportunity to glut themselves on the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The very thing John tells us Satan has designed this world to appeal to. He's the God of this world. 1 John 2, 15 through 16. Um, actually through verse 17, really. But um, right now, guys, the, the church is the moral conscience of the world. When we are taken off the earth, there's nothing gonna left to restrain the evil in men's hearts. You think, well, what about the believers in the tribulation period? Their role is going to be different then. Their, their role is one of, of, of serving God, but basically trying to survive. They're not living side by side with the people of the world in the sense where they can be a light. They're just trying to, to uh, help one another to survive and so on. Their role will be a little different. During the tribulation period, uh, nothing will restrain the evil in men's hearts. It's going to be, think about this, Sodom and Gomorrah on a global scale. Think about that. Sodom and Gomorrah, immorality, uh, unbridled uh, evil and immorality. Uh, the whole world will be like Sodom and Gomorrah during that time. Now the Antichrist is going to hook people in initially by promising them freedom. Freedom. But it will be a false freedom that will actually put people into bondage to their flesh. This is interesting to me. Um, turn to Second Peter 2 real quick. Because Peter mentioned something along these lines. 2 Peter 2, verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. What's Peter talking about? Well, the context uh, Peter is talking about here is false, false teachers. Um, the Antichrist is going to be the ultimate example of a false teacher, all right? And he's going to promise the world all kinds of things if they follow him. I believe one of the things he'll promise them is that they can become gods. The very lie that Satan fed the human race in the beginning, 6,000 years ago, has been growing, growing, coming to, you know, now it's, it's reached the whole world uh, through things like Hinduism and New Age movement and different things, but... Um, I believe the Antichrist, the gospel he's going to preach. And he will have a gospel because he is going to hold himself up as a God. And the good news that he's going to preach is, look, follow me, worship me, and I will teach you how you can become a God just like I've become a God. Man's always wanted that since the Garden of Eden, right? The problem is, well, as one of my favorite Bible teachers once said, Dave Hunt, the devil didn't, wasn't honest with Eve. In the day that you eat of the fruit of this tree, God knows your eyes will be open and you'll become like God. What he didn't tell Eve was she wouldn't be, become the true God. She would become a God with a little g, a grasper after Godhood. And that's what we're going to have, a world full of little gods in control. Somebody said recently, you think a strong man can create a lot of damage? You ain't seen nothing until you see what weak men will do in the way that they enslave and persecute and punish. There's a lot of people in our country, in government, who are weak people. Their ideas can't stand up in the public forum. So shut them down, cancel them, shut them up, put them away. Because their ideas don't hold water. Yet, they are clinging to them. It's interesting. These people would rather... You think that this administration would change course. Everything is falling apart. Everything is about as bad as it could be. Nothing they're trying is doing anything positive or good, right? You think they would change course. But somebody said they would rather burn everything down than not hold the right ideology. In their mind, they got the right ideology. And if it's 
not going to work. There's nothing left that we have. I don't care if the whole thing burns down. We are not. We are politically correct. It's interesting that right now, guys, those in the world who think they're free are really in bondage. They don't know it, right? Peter talks about them. They're promised freedom by their teachers. And they think they're free, but they're really in bondage. And it's amazing that these very people who think, who think of those who in their minds are in bondage. That would be us, you Christians. You can't have any fun. You know, you you got to obey commandments that your God gives you. Hey, we're really free. We can go out and party and have sex and do all these things. We're not limited uh, to, you know, we can, we're really free. And, And as they stand with their faces pressed up against the bars of their cells, you know, we're really free. They don't realize that we are actually the ones who are free, free in Christ. We're free not to sin. They think their freedom is all about them, in our minds, sinning. Their freedom, so-called, is bringing them into bondage or has brought them into bondage while they rail against us as if we're the ones who are really prisoners of our faith. It's amazing. It really is. Well, back to Revelation 18, verse 14. John goes on, The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you and you shall find them uh, you shall find them no more at all the merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment weeping and wailing and saying alas alas that great city that was clothed in fine linen purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour great riches came, their great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who traveled by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. We see, guys, three groups mentioned that bemoan the destruction of commercial Babylon. Kings, merchants, and those that trade by sea, which suggests that the foundation of the city is world trade. World trade. So if this is a literal reference to the city of Babylon rebuilt, or uh, whether the passage is using Babylon in a mystical sense, it tells us that this will be a literal city and not an allegorical one. So we just get let's just get that on the table. So a lot of commentators want to write this off as being just allegorical. But no, I think the Holy Spirit is teaching us that whatever this city is, literal Babylon rebuilt in modern Iraq or some other major world city that metaphorically is being referred to as Babylon, it's a real city. All right? And again, it could be using Babylon as a metaphor representing, you know, New York or Brussels, London, Paris, or, you know, some other world-class commercial city during the tribulation period that becomes, at least for a while, the Antichrist capital city of his global empire well we don't know for sure but we do know that this city will be built on world trade so it's not going to be a small insignificant city if it's not literally babylon rebuilt in iraq um, it's going to be a city that you know very well i mean it wasn't jerusalem called sodom and egypt in scripture because of their immorality okay jerusalem um so if God is just metaphorically calling the city Babylon, uh, when it comes to light, what city this is, you're going to know it. I mean, you, you'll, we're not going to be here, but if God was to tol- tell us right now, oh, by the way, uh, I, was, I, was, I was speaking metaphorically, the city is actually going to be, you know, New York, Brussels, you, you, you're going to know, oh, okay. You're not going to say, where's that? No, it's, it's not going to be that way. All right, it's going to be a major city. 
Now, the merchants lament because their materialistic passions. This is interesting to me. The merchants of the earth lament because their materialistic passions, or lusts, really, can no longer be fulfilled, can no longer be satisfied. It's almost like, and to me it is, a drug. It's like, a, it's like an addict that God has ripped from them their high, their drug, which for them is abject wealth and luxury. Okay? I mean, who else but the uber-wealthy would fit into that category, right? But know this, the weeping that begins here on earth for these people will last for eternity in hell. Turn back to Revelation 14. And remember something. Revelation 18 is a flashback to an earlier time. And I believe the earlier time is chapter 14. And let's read verses 8 to 11. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself also shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. These um, greedy merchants or the classic illustration of all those that Jesus warned us, listen, not to be like. Remember what he said in Mark 8, verses 36 and 37? The Lord Jesus said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing on this earth is worth your soul. No, no amount of money, fame, n- nothing. Because if you could gain the whole world, if somehow you could be the king of the world and have access to all the wealth of the world, all the pleasures of the world, and let's just say for the sake of argument, you were granted a long life. Say that you could enjoy that for 150 years. That's a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world but lost his soul? Or what would a man give or a woman give in exchange for their soul? I mean, what a terrible trade. Yet people make it all the time. People are making this trade all the time. They are trading their eternities Jesus is offering them a free gift of eternal life. Live with him forever in his kingdom of total joy and uh, just, you know, joy unspeakable, full of glory, right? And yet they don't want that. They want the immediate satisfaction of having wealth, fame, whatever right now. I'm convinced that if a person could make a deal with the, the devil literally, I mean, they're making one when they reject Christ, they don't realize it. But let's just say they could sign a contract. And the contract would say, look, I'm going to give you 150 years, and during that time, I'm going to make you the most wealthy person that has ever lived. You'll be King Midas. I am convinced, but then afterward, you're going to spend eternity with me. I don't hesitate to say. I believe a lot of people would make that trade. I I really believe that. I think it was in the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea. I think Ben Johnson was the 100-meter runner that year. You you saw that guy. It was like 
an action figure. He was cut, ripped. I mean, the guy was muscle upon muscle. And he blasted uh, to the 100-meter finish line and uh, won the gold. Then it was found out he was taking anabolic steroids, which shortened your life. So it got into this whole conversation. They began to ask athletes if by taking anabolic steroids, you could be guaranteed that you would die in five years, but by taking them, you could win the gold. What would you take? I couldn't believe how many athletes said, I'd rather have the gold. You'd rather only live for five more years if you could have the gold? And I thought, wow. That's kind of what we're talking about. People losing their eternities for a few years on the earth of pleasure and wealth and fame, whatever they're into. Um, it's amazing. Terrible trade. Materialism is temporary. Your soul is eternal. Verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God, is av God has avenged you on her. Notice how the world rejoices when it should weep, and it weeps when it should rejoice. Why is that? Well, because there is a moral inversion today and one coming that will be unlike anything that has ever come before it. Uh, what is that moral inversion? Well, Jesus, uh, God said it in Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. You know, what the world calls good, often God calls evil. What the world calls evil, often God calls good. Jesus said it in Luke 16, verse 15, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And every time the uh, Academy Awards come on, which I, I haven't watched in 20 years, but every time Hollywood throws a big gala and they give each other all these nice awards, I always think to myself, what is highly prized among the people of the world is an abomination in the sight of God. The immorality um, in Hollywood and how what they put on the screen and so on. Uh, but, but, but think about just the summer of 2020. Antifa. Black Lives Matter, burning down businesses, burning down police, uh, uh, you know, what is it, police, were they offices, or help me out, guys, precincts, thank you. <laughs> burning down police precincts with the cops still in them. That was good. That was good, we, we were told. Of course, we saw it as evil. Anybody who said it was evil... The world jumped on them, canceled them. You're evil, right? When drag queens perform for little kids, that's good. Some guy followed one of them out to the parking lot filming him, said, you just dance in front of children naked. How, 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 how is that not sick and twisted? And he wouldn't, you know, he just kept walking to his car, you know. Your mother's a blank. Okay, but he said, okay, fine. But this is sick and twisted. No, no, the world thinks it's good. And those who think it's evil, Christians, we're the ones the world says are evil. It's going to get worse before Jesus returns and makes everything right. Moral inversion, not under his administration. Right is right under his administration. Wrong will be wrong. Not today. Right is wrong and wrong is right kind of thing, right? Um, but I want you to notice the contrast the merchants and kings of the earth they're wailing and mourning and right um, they're the earth dwellers they're mourning and wailing because it's all they know is the earth this is their home right and yet what's going on in heaven what, 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 are, what is happening uh, in, in, with the inhabitants of heaven verse 20 Rejoice over her, O heaven, you holy apostles, for God has avenged you on her, right? It's amazing that what the world considers bad, again, 
Uh, it's amazing. God has judged the evil of the world. The people of the world are wailing and mourning because their God has been destroyed. The world was their God. The people of God are going to rejoice because God is judging the wicked in preparation for Jesus to come and establish a kingdom for the righteous, right? Kingdom for the righteous. Uh, let me just finish this. We'll close. Um, it's very important, guys, that um, God's people look at life and world events. And this is something especially true now, okay? Because we have a tendency to look at what's happening and it's dragging people down. Christians. This is bad. It's bad around us, right? Our country is disintegrating before our very eyes. The country we love, we grew up in. It's very important, though, that God's people look at life and world events from God's point of view, from heaven's perspective, and not like Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, who looked at things from earth's perspective. Everything is emptiness and vanity. Where? Under the sun. He was looking at life from a human vantage point, perspective. And we have to remember that our God is always viewing this world in terms of eternity. This is all in God's plan. Everything is, is, is be, being wrapped up for Jesus' return. Human governments are imploding. Values are decaying. It's amazing to watch it on a nightly basis. You watch the news, you think, Lord, it's, I've never seen anything like it. It's, all, it's like I'm watching a house fire and the house is just slowly being consumed. Well, we are. God is allowing man to have the very thing he's always wanted, to be God and be in control. How you doing out there, man? You know? I mean, it's gotten so bad that many people are jumping ship. I'm not sure they're getting saved, but they're jumping their, Demo their Democratic Party and other things. Um, but I think as Christians, it's very important that we look at what's going on from heaven's vantage point. This was all prophesied by God. He told us what we're reading. We're studying what he said was coming. We have to look at this life from heaven's perspective. Because um, when we do, we will rejoice. Let me just close by asking, what do you rejoice over? And I think I know the answer. What, what, what do you rejoice over? So a lot of Christians rejoice in things that are not evil, but are tied to the world. I rejoice when Trump was in office and my 401k was doing so great. Well, Trump's not in office and Trump's not the issue. Jesus Christ is the issue. Forget the 401k. He's got a tremendous retirement plan. If you're just smart enough to jump on board. I mean, looking at the state of the world, we should be praying the Lord's Prayer with new zeal. Lord, your kingdom come, please. I've never prayed that prayer with more fervency and flat-out sincerity than I have in the last two years. I used to kind of feel, Lord, I know your coming is near, but, you know, I kind of want to see my grandkids grow up, and I want to retire with my wife, and, you know, do some things that we haven't been able to do, and you've given us such a wonderful life, and, and so on and so forth. And I think what God is allowing is he's allowing things to happen that are slowly prying the world away from our hands, and now we're screaming, Lord Jesus, come quickly, you know, because only he can fix us. All right, we'll leave it there. We will definitely finish chapter 18 next week, get into what I think is, well, I don't think, I know is the greatest chapter, uh, at least one, because the last three or four, cha uh, three chapters are incredible. So we'll come out of this dark period into the sunlight. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us hope. The world, there is no hope in the world. The world is rapidly passing away and all the lusts of it. But those who uh, 
love you, worship you. We are going to live forever in your kingdom. And we thank you, Lord. Um, give us grace. As we look at our world that's imploding, disintegrating, that we not look at this world and what's happening from earth's perspective, but that we get up into the heavenlies. You have seated us with Christ in the heavenly places, your word tells us. Give us the grace to have that heavenly vantage point as we look down upon what's going on and to see everything in the light of eternity. You are allowing man, as the saying goes, to have enough rope to hang himself. Things are wrapping up. Your coming is getting very near, even at the door. We thank you, Lord. We ask you to keep blessing these studies in your word. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.